Thank you, uh, Dr. Sword, and thank you for having us in this class, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I'll be very, very, very quick, but I just wanted to mention that this is part of a series of public lectures that we do on different topics, and if you're interested, let us know, either myself or Amy Correa, who's uh, right, right there in the back. Uh, we, we're going to do, for instance, uh, a lecture coming up in a uh, few weeks on Hershey Cuba, uh, the history of the Hershey uh, involvement with, with Cuba before the revolution. Next week, we're doing a, a, a memorial, a, a panel discussion in memory of Robert Matos, who just recently died, and so on. So I, just, I don't want to bore you with the details, but just to let you know that we have a very active uh, a program of public events. So uh, uh, let me now introduce briefly uh, our speaker, uh, Nancy Regal, who earned her PhD in history from Columbia University, where she also received the Richard Hofstadter Fellowship. She also holds a Master of Philosophy and Master of Arts in History from Columbia. Her BA in History is from the University of Havana, Cuba, <coughs> where she was also a research assistant at the Center for Marti Studies and the National Archives of Cuba. Uh, previously, she was an assistant professor of history at Adelphi University and a visiting assistant professor of history at Lehman College in New York. Her teaching and research interests focus on the social, economic, and political history of Cuba, which is the topic of today's talk but also on African slavery in Latin America and the Caribbean and migration uh, in the 19th and 20th century. She has conducted extensive or covered research at various places, such as the Library of Congress, the New York Historical Society, the New York Public Library, the National Archives of Cuba, and several provincial archives in Cuba as well. And she has lectured uh, on these topics uh, of her interest at Princeton, Harvard, and the City of New York. So it's a great pleasure to be with Nancy Pei. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Professor Hogan Thank you, Professor Emma Sordo, and members of the Queen for having me here today in this class. Good morning to all of you. So this talk is about a local history. The history of a small town in Cuba, Baez. So to give you an idea of what Baez was in the 1950s, which is the last decade that I covered my study, I would say that in 1953, which was the last census of the Cuban Republican period, Baez has a population of 6,714 people. To put those numbers in perspective, could you hear me? Sorry, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Okay, great. So to put those numbers in perspective, let's say that the entire population of Baez in 1953 could perfectly fit in one section of the FIU stadium which has a population of 23,500 people, right? So that gave you an idea, that's giving you an idea how small this was this time, right? How small was Yes? How do you spell the name of it? Baez, B-A-E-C, Baez, B-C, C words, okay? So, uh, but this wasn't a small town and my topic is to discover what was the impact of those people, right, in the history of Cuba. As a student of Latin American civilization history, you prob probably know about the importance of silver mining production in Mexico and Peru, right? Or the importance for, for the colonial administration of sugar plantation economies in Brazil and the Caribbean. Or the impact, the importance, the significance of the poor cities for colonial administrations as was the case of Buenos Aires in the late colonial period, uh, connected to the uh, export economy, right? The Atlantic world in the case of Buenos, uh, of Buenos Aires. But we know less about those towns that were surrounding the big centers of production. Right? They were not directly part of it, but they have their own uh, history. And his, his people has also uh, their own history. They were not connected to the export economy, and they were not, and for that reason, they developed in, in their own ways, right? In their own ways. Um, and they are not invisible. They have something to tell to the regional, and local, and of course, the national history. In the case of Cuba, we could find a lot of documents in the colonial period that talk about Cuba, a strategic position at the entrance of the Gulf of Mexico. And how this was considered an advantage and justified, an advantage for the colonial government's perspective and 
and how these justify Cuba's enrollment in the colonial enterprises, right? But uh, those are the first uh, uh, village founded by the conquistadors in Cuba, for the map. Uh, as the history of the population shows, those villages that were uh, founded on, on the coastal area were the ones who has a history of exposure to the exterior. It was not the case for those interior lands that have a, uh, a different uh, development, uh, a very uh, slow pace development. So, uh, what is Baez? Baez is a small town located in this region, the central region of Cuba, right between Trinidad and San Espíritu. That region is called Las Guillas, precisely because it has several uh, foundational villages from the, from the 16th century. So it was a small town. The inn is social and economic activity dedicated to the production for the internal market. Cattle raising, uh, diversified to a small scale, uh, show, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, so system production, agricultural production, and of course, very well connected to the internal market. Uh, demographic population, different to those uh, areas that were more uh, related to the sugar economy, to slavery. They have a population, free people, in terms of uh, slavery, free people, and non and, and white uh, population in the area. Of course, because it was not related to the sugar economy. So in its pattern of role and its social and economic structure, but it was the norm for most non-sugar regions uh, beyond the colonial period in the Republican period as well, between 1902 and 1959. That is in those zones in which the, uh, the white population constitute the dominant majority, and in which small-scale agriculture, care raising, commerce, and small-scale manufacturing create certain economic stability instead of a dynamic development <coughs> capable of transforming uh, the traditional economic structure of the localities. So what... Uh, is the contribution of this study to the history of Cuba. It's very simple. Uh, Baez uh, is a good example to demonstrate the less known uh, history of Cuba, uh, the history of those considered uh, secondary uh, localities because they are impact on the economic uh, development of the island. But with this study, I try to show the, the diversities, right? The diversities of uh, for uh, Cuban uh, regional uh, development, the diversity, the, the complexities of that development as well. So uh, let me give you a, a brief history of uh, Cuban population. At the time of the conquest, the Cuban population was, uh, uh, the indigenous population was not uh, as large as was in other areas of the continent. And they, the, their numbers were located in the eastern part of the island. They were moving uh, to the west, and that process was interrupted by the conquest. As for the reason that you probably know, uh, violence, diseases, and hard work uh, justified the decimation of the indigenous population in the Caribbean and other areas, as well as, and as was the, ca the case of Cuba. So, uh, what happened was that the first village were founded by the conquistadors, and in the early 16th century and to the middle of the 16th century, most of these villages were depopulated because people were joining the colonial enterprises. So what happened with the interior lands that was, for the sort of reason, all completely, completely uh, depopulated? So what happened to that, to that, to the, those indigenous land? And how was their development throughout the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th century? So how does this work organized? I'm trying to look at bias from the perspective of that region that I mentioned, the central region of Cuba. So because it's not an isolated case, I have to look, I have to look at what's happening in its connection with uh, other regions of that, other areas of that region and with the national, at the national level as well. Uh, that's why I put a, the history in the context of that <coughs> region. So what is the origins of the town? The land, the land question, which is very important. I mentioned that at the beginning, those areas, the main village was almost depopulated. And this process changed throughout the 16th century standard recovery of that. 
why? Why do you think it is the recovery of the uh, uh, after the first stage <coughs> of uh, popula uh, the population? What do you think has happened in other areas of Latin America? What do you think th there was a recovery of that of that population? What do you think is the the justification for the early recovery, let's say, in the, in the first half of the 16th century, mainly in the Caribbean area? Any idea? Any idea of why the population was start to recover? Well, uh, let's say that after <coughs> after after uh, the first movement to the colonial enterprises, uh, after those who abandoned the island, uh, there was uh, some that continues coming and remain there because there was a demand for products, uh, particular products, particular uh, productions in the colonial enterprises. And Cuba doesn't have uh, silver, was the case of Mexico and Peru, but Cuba has plenty of lands. But lands by itself mean nothing. Lands have to be, have to have a, a purpose, right? So the first, the first uh, uh, distribution of land, and this topic is very complex in the case of Cuba, uh, the first distribution of land and penetration to that interior land in the 16th century uh, was led by the uh, local elite. And the local elites were so uh, active in that process precisely because there was not other, uh, I, was like, no, I mentioned there was no silver or gold, uh, but they also doesn't have the didn't have the opportunity to get high, the highest position in the government because those positions were reserved for uh, Spaniards uh, that came from, from the peninsula. So they looked at the, the potential of having land to connect, to, to make uh, that recognition, that status recognition also to connect them uh, with what was going on in the colonies. But also because there was a recovery of the population and population centers demand demand certain, of course, production, and, uh, agricultural production, and, of course, cattle, uh, cattle by products. So that's the reason why this, the, the process of to move to the interior land to, to get uh, recognition, to get ownership of the interior land started in Cuba so early, and mainly in that region from the 16th century. So uh, what happened uh, in the case of Baez, let's say that The first, the first uh, colonial document uh, that dealt with the bias was mentioned it as an Ato de Vacas. Ato de Vacas is, let me show you this. That was by in 1804, an Ato de Vacas. Uh, um, Ato de Vacas means uh, a granted land for uh, cattle raising economy. They were uh, later called haciendas, called haciendas, and the first, the first uh, notice of that was in the 1804. So, uh, what are the reasons behind that expansion and the uh, recognition of that area as anato? Because there was a, a, a demand for cattle raising in the population centers, as was the case of Havana, and the main village in the center part of the island, but also. Uh, in, in the Havana region, uh, there was a start in the, pro the process of tobacco cultivation and also because the, the mercantile flood from Spain uh, was stopping there. It was a, a, a tremendous impact and, and that generates a demand for that kind of production, foodstuff production and of course uh, cattle production. So by start to send uh, cattle uh, to uh, <coughs> the main village of the red central region, uh, mainly Santa Clara, which was uh, the jurisdiction, uh, another jurisdiction created in that region in 1689. So by start to contribute with that to uh, <coughs> the articulation of the uh, early uh, internal markets. And with that, uh, in that process, let's say that uh, it was not uh, a road system, it was not a transportation system at the time. So what really happened is that with movement of cattle to different areas, uh, the proximities and the, and, the, and the population centers that were more close to that, there was <coughs> an early articulation of uh, certain roads, right? Very uh, precarious in, in their conditions, but the articulation of that. And people were moving, were 
uh, knowing each other, uh, we're creating a dynamic. We're very particular to that, to that area. From 1804 uh, to the 1790s, what prevailed in the, in the Atto was an extensive exploitation of land for cattle race. What means extensive exploitation of land? means that uh, the cattle was uh, pasture free throughout the, uh, the whole territory, and, and there was not, there was not, it was free, it was not organized in that sense. In, uh, uh, in order to provide for those centers that I mentioned. Also, another important aspect to keep in mind in the 17th century is the impact of contraband. So there was a lot of products that uh, came out of that real uh, to contraband. So that's also what justified the creation of this in 1804. Uh, another aspect to that is that if you look at the Cuban economic cycles that we will see first uh, uh, cattle raising activities and production for the population centers and later on in, after 79 is uh, sugar production and slavery and of course uh, uh, that process which is done 79 is going uh, to remain until the last uh, decades of the political period in the 1950s uh, you see that uh, those big uh, export economies uh, uh, the work, those populations were uh, connected to the export economy uh, developed very different. In the case of Vice, what happened with this was in the 18th century, the early 18th century, uh, what the population, the demographic composition, that were free people, the so-called uh, free laborers, right? Uh, mm, rural workers or peones. And those people who were there uh, were in charge of the, uh, uh, the capital that was uh, in the Sienda because the landowners at this time were not present. They were in the city uh, of Santa Clara. So they were taking care. And that justified the slow pace of demographic movement to the areas because they were mainly single men, uh, men and there was uh, not uh, data of families, uh, settlements at this time, because the one who really uh, participated in that kind of activities were the uh, free, free laborers, and there was not, they, they didn't require a concentration of them in the territory. Uh, what else? After 1790s, what happened in, it was not only the expansion of sugar, but also transformation in the cattle economy. Because from that period, uh, the cattle economy was very uh, well organized in terms of better, more effective <coughs> exploitation of land, the concentration of land, defenses land of so-called potreros. So what started to happen in Bias after that period was uh, more people living in that area, more farming, because there was an explosion of sugar regions in the surroundings. So they were not only producing to uh, guarantee demands of local uh, uh, populations, but also to sugar regions. What cattle and cattle byproducts, what uh, tides, um, uh, salty meat to feed the slave population, and so on. So what we see here is uh, in the early 19th century, a concentration of families in that territory. Let me see. Okay. So this is Las Villas province of Santa Clara, Sil Fuegos, Asagua La Grande, uh, San Juan de los Remedios, and San Espíritu San Trinidad. Baez uh, belongs to the jurisdiction of Santa Clara. Uh, an important aspect to consider is the sugar plantation uh, economy of this area. Uh, this area, is, as you see, is located in the center of Cuba and has been considered, historically has been associated with the sugar production economy and has been considered also a frontier, a frontier region. Why a frontier region? Because the sugar economy during the colonial uh, period, let's say 70, after 1790s, and um, until 1898 was concentrated in the eastern part of the island, right? And uh, Las Villas has been considered several th times as part of that, of that process. But that, this is not real, because not all the uh, western part of the island was connected to the sugar economy. Just some years of Havana and Matanzas, okay? uh, sorry, I'm not in the second and third division of the map, uh, Havana and Matanzas, only areas of Havana and Matanzas has been, uh, were part of that explosion. And by response, uh, uh, the western part of Las Villas, Cienfuegos, 
Sawala Grandes, and later on, the, the second half of the, of the 19th century, Remedio. Those areas, there were, yes, there were uh, sugar plantations. They developed a sugar plantation economy as a response of the expansion from the West. But those connected to the east and to the interior were associated with what prevailed in the eastern part of the island during the colonial period, which was a more diversified economy, a more diversified economy oriented to the internal, uh, internal market. So that's just to find the difference, right? And bias is located precisely in the second, in the second model, the second economic model. More diversified economy, uh, a concentration of, of free people in, time, in, terms, uh, in terms of slavery, and sheep lands. Sheep lands because it were interior lands. They were not well connected, uh, there was not a good transportation system, they were not connected to the exterior, and they were, yes, producing, but producing for those areas, not necessarily directly connected with what was going on, right? There was no huge transformation uh, in the uh, socioeconomic structure of this uh, town from that period. Those transformations, we talk about those transformations in the early uh, 20th uh, century, but before that, let's talk about the impact of independence war in the territory. So, uh, from 1868 to 1879, the first, the first, uh, 1868, 1879, the first uh, Cuban independence war, the so called uh, 10 years independence war, uh, explode in the eastern part of Cuba, right? I was moving to that area to the west. There was a person that was stopped before reaching uh, the western part of the island. But my point here is that <coughs> those areas, as was the case of Cienfuegos, Aguala Grande, uh, San Juan de los Remedios, and the, I'm sorry, Trinidad, and some points, and the western part of the island, where the regions that were very well protected, right? And the sugar mills continue producing at time at the time of the war because they had a protection not only of the landowners but also the colonial authorities, the uh, Spanish uh, pro-Spanish merchants. And what happened to that part of the island where the uh, uh, war start? Those were uh, exposed to the violence, exposed to the, the, the uh, combat from both, both parts, but also the population of those centers when the population uh, really responds to the independence idea, right? Those uh, yeah, rural populations, some of them, the, the so-called uh, uh, free people of colors, I don't like that uh, uh, determination, but it was uh, in the colonial don't come and don't know why, free, no whites. So these are uh, people where they want to really respond to that. So what's happening in Bice in particular, Bice com remained completely devastated after. And those surrounding localities as well, the ones who are close to, to it, they were completely devastated. So this process that started in the, in, the begin in the beginning of the 19th century, when there were families producing for those sugar towns and so on, was completely paralyzed. And when it started to recover after 1878, came the Second Independence War from 1892, 1895. Those, what really happened was at the, uh, at the beginning of the Republican period, 1902, Vice was almost depopulated, most of its production was advantaged, but there were still uh, fertile lands that were the ones who attract immigrants. Immigrants, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, transatlantic uh, migration movement that also uh, reached Cuba, uh, that started uh, in the early, uh, sorry, in the late, uh, from 1880s to 1930s. So Cuba, Migration and who were the ones who migrate to uh, that area? Mostly uh, those from the Canary Islands. And that's a very important aspect to consider because those who came from the Canary Islands didn't, came to, didn't come directly to buy. They uh, came to different areas in the uh, peripheral uh, uh, zones, those who were. Uh, highly uh, demand of sugar, sugar production, but they abandoned that uh, mostly uh, after a couple of months and moved to the interior uh, to look for quiet, uh, sheep and uh, fertile <coughs> lands. So the justification of that is was because there was a long history, right, of connection uh, with the uh, uh, Canary Island immigration uh, to Cuba. They were identified as, as, as agricultural laborers and there was the, the network that they create really attract uh, 
a lot of people to that area. And bias has a history also of that, because we don't have enough time to discuss that in detail. I just want to focus on attention that this story shows that those immigrants who came from the Canary Islands to the region of Las Villas, as not mentioned in the other part of Cuba, were uh, concentrating, working not necessarily on the sugar plantation economies. They were there producing tobacco, cultivating. They were dedicated to the cultivation of tobacco. And tobacco was the main economic activity of bias in the Republican period. Also, what is really important to know is that tobacco, but tobacco not for international market, tobacco for domestic market, cigars and tobacco. So they, yes, buy exports uh, the leaf to American companies, but mostly the, uh, the growth of that production was from the domestic, uh, domestic uh, market. And that's justified the expansion of the time. That justified, uh, I have a couple of, of, I don't know if I can show you, the expansion of the time, uh, population growth, population growth as well as urbanization, and threat of services. And important because I would like to uh, uh, almost finish here and save some time for, for debate. Uh, what happened at this time was that the urban layout did not respond to the traditional colonial town where the square, the church, and the uh, administrative and go uh, governmental buildings were around, or the traditional layout of the of the uh, sugar towns, right, the so-called batteries. It was different. The urban uh, development of this town uh, it starts from the manufacture of tobacco, right, the manufacture, the tobacco uh, workshops. So we, you will see there are different, uh, uh, I will show you different, let me see, the plan. Okay, let me see. this is uh, uh, in the 1930s, it was a, a rural celebration. And there's here uh, the position. This is uh, one of uh, the ideas from the veterans of the independence movement. This is another separate. And uh, this is the urban layout. So it's very well, very strict in, it, in their uh, composition because mostly of the town span from the, man, the, the uh, tobacco workshops. And here we see uh, road constructions and the local newspapers. Mostly you see here this buena perspectiva tabacalera, which means good uh, future for the uh, tobacco industry, manufacture. We have uh, local <coughs> bar and bodega, and those are tobacco brands from us. And then what is really important to understand, most of these brands uh, were, uh, uh, they, they, they were uh, petitioned in the 1930s. And this is an important aspect, because this, the fact that this, the, this locality was produced for the domestic market, the fluctuation of the tobacco uh, international market uh, was less, uh, less. Uh, uh, the impact was less in, in this locality. It doesn't mean that it was not affected. It was affected less than other areas of Cuba, uh, where the uh, so-called tobacco of well tobacco in the uh, in the western part of the Cuba in the Rio, where the data show uh, migration for those towns precisely because the impact of the tobacco industry. So the fact that these people were producing for domestic markets justified the expansion of these brands uh, during uh, in the 1930s. And this is the church. And this is this this picture were taken in 2004. So uh, you see the deterioration, but gave you an idea that those were mansions, right, at the time. So that's gave an idea uh, how well uh, the tobacco uh, manufacturer, uh, of course, how well it was for, for the town to get those uh, kind of uh, activity that again were not as. Um, they were not as 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 good to find an adjective for that. How they were not as uh, revolutionary, to call it some way, as the big one connected to the export economy in terms of 
the, the social, the, the transformation, their social structure, but they provide certain stability, certain uh, well-being to the population of that of that uh, locality, as well as uh, finally, let me show you this this one. This was one of the Canary Island immigrants that they are uh, at the my channel doing the, the oral. Uh, History, they, they, he was showing me there are documents that were very, very good to, to this presentation. In other words, uh, this is uh, the history of a town that was connected to other activities that also are part of the Cuban history. So we don't, we don't, uh, we don't know enough about the articulation of the early economic activities related to the internal market. And we have an example here. We have people living here, people who join uh, the. Uh, big events of Cuban history in different ways, right? So uh, they were part of the Cuban liberation movement, but they also justify uh, the impact of migration in the early 20th century, and also explain why there were several Cuban towns in the interior, uh, uh, in the hinterland, that have differences. Yeah, they are not the same as others, which had a long colonial history, and, and those who were uh, associated with the show approach. So I, I would prefer to stop here. I'm sorry I've been talking uh, too fast and my English is not the best, but, uh, but I, I would like you just to, to uh, pay, uh, call your attention because if you are studying Latin American history, it's, uh, it's, it's good for you to look beyond, right? To read between the lines what's happening at the official history at the macro level and look at the differences, right? In any, any locality, any, any region of Latin America, this serve and start, right? So I, I will encourage you to look at those differences to make that uh, history more rich, right? And credible for, for those who like to know about it. Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> it would be a good time to ask more details. What brought? industry, the cattle industry, and the tobacco industry to an end was so abruptly in, in those years. Yes. What was that? No. Uh, I end so abruptly here, but because I would like to pay attention to other aspects. Tobacco, well, the cattle raising economy continues, right? And the agricultural uh, production continues. But what really happened was there was production uh, oriented to uh, domestic markets and so on. But what I, I would like to do is that those were traditional activities that remained in the town. But what was new in the 20th century was tobacco, right? Tobacco. There is a history of tobacco cultivation in Cuba, but not precisely in this locality. So what is, for me, called the attention is that those economic, traditional economic activities remain because the demands remain. But what's happening here is that tobacco, and tobacco related to an important episode in the history of Cuba, which is uh, immigration, right? The Spanish immigration, especially Canary, uh, for those people from the Canary Islands. So that's why I'm focused on, on the, uh, we yes, to continue with that, but also looking at the other facts, uh, the other factors, right? That was the case of tobacco. But the, yes, both, the both activities remain very important, okay? But the difference was that if you look at the numbers of product, in terms of production, those were the ones who represent, right? most value at the end. But with tobacco, that changed. There was a shift of that. They remained, they were important, but tobacco, yes, uh, contributed more, more money to the development of the town. Yes. Any other question? Yes. Um, was tobacco in, in the investors, were they more like the foreigners, you know, like uh, Spaniards, or you had other you know, main, um, inland investors who decided to invest in tobacco in, in bias? Uh. Yes, uh, yes, they are both. <coughs> yes, what really happened is there were, at the beginning, there was a no good, good definition between the urban town and the countryside, right? But what happened was the surrounding areas that were dedicated to cult the cultivation of tobacco, there was a demand for the leaf, raw material to those American companies that were located in strategically uh, zones for tobacco cultivation. They were demanding the, the leaves, right? But with uh, a process that started, yeah, first with the cultivation of tobacco, they were moving workshop. The first workshop started in the family, in the family house. People, women, all, everybody participated in that. And then they were bigger and they were start uh, building 
a bigger workshop in the in the in the town um, start to spend right. Uh, but was production those who start with the manufacturing were the locals, and the production was for the national market, for the national market of tobacco and cigars. So there was never an industrialization period in Cuba. Because we, we we're only talking about domestic demand, and, and yes, but there was never an, a big exploit of it. Well, what happened is in Cuba, that's what I'm talking about economic cycles. Uh, we have in Cuba first uh, this, uh, well, not only cattle raising and, uh, and agricultural uh, uh, production, tobacco was an important part, of course. Uh, in the 17th century in some areas of the western part of Cuba, but sugar was a determinant. Sugar, sugar at the beginning, sugar uh, uh, in the 19th century, uh, the colonial time, sugar uh, owners were uh, locals, Spaniards, and they were, uh, the way that they used to increase uh, production was expansion, land expansion, right? and expansion because uh, they was moving uh, to the cultivation to, to a different area. So my point here is that we have slavery because we don't have a lot of people working freely on those. We have a, a massive influence to slavery and with the slavery there's another topic. We have the, uh, the centuries revolution, right? The implication of that for those sugar plantations. So what we made in Cuba was yeah, the, the fear of slavery. That's why I mentioned all the time free population working in that that town because it's slavery. Uh, the slaves were the ones who uh, were uh, uh, related to the sugar, sugar, yes, sugar production. In the late uh, 19th century, start, uh, let's say, the industrialization of Cuban sugar production. With the, the of course, the, uh, the, the, the conglomeration, the concentration of industry in the big units, as was the case of Central Azucarero. They were not the all ingenious, right? Central Azucarero and the railroads. And that process that I start in the western part of the island, as I mentioned it to you, uh, was completely, uh, has a different dynamic and different phase in the period, in the 20th century, because after uh, North American intervention in Cuba, those lands that were not reserved for sugar production in the eastern part of Cuba, which was the case of Camagüey and Oriente, uh, they were the ones who really had the big uh, uh, sugar companies, that was the case of United uh, and sugar company, United Fruit Company, and so on. So they have that kind of, yes, uh, industrialization as a topic that we need to serve of this discussion because it was, the sugar industry was uh, mostly owned by the United States companies. So that's that's why. And then what came the revolution and it's different. And part. even if it's out of the topic, only if you want to answer. Now, what happened to all that? What type, well, the, the sugar industry, the sugar production is, is insignificant. They closed a lot of, of, of centrales azucareros, I think it was in the 90s, uh, since the late 90s, and, and it's not part of that. They had not the same impact. Cuba, the history of Cuba is the history of monoculture, and Cuba means that. So, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Was there any change in the origins of the immigrants, uh, Galicians, uh, other immigrants from Spain? <laughs> well, uh, most of the, the records show that most of the immigrants there were from Canary Islands. So what is, uh, is important is there was other areas in the eastern part of Cuba, as was the case of Holguin, that have uh, Canary Islands immigrants working on sugar plantation. And then they came to the contracts, it was the case of, 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 of Las Villas. But in Las Villas, if we look at the number of the census, the data shows that there was an agricultural province and they were renegated in the sugar production. So most of those who came to Las Villas work on different activities. And in Vice in particular were uh, migrants from the, immigrants from the Canary Islands. No, uh, they were also from Galicia and other areas on Spain were more minimal. The, the, the gross uh, immigration was from the Canary Islands. And they have uh, they, they, they cultivation of tobacco. I think the first data of, of, of immigration there uh, was when the, the Spaniards, uh, Spanish uh, administration request, I think it was in the late 16th century, colonization with uh, uh, families from the, from the Canary Islands. There were several uh, demands for that throughout the colonial period, uh, but mostly, uh, mostly with a transatlantic migration of the late 
19th century and beginning of the 20th century, uh, those who came from Spain, uh, which were in massive numbers, they have a very well distinguished uh, uh, profile. And those who, the, the Catalans and, and the, the Galicians, and, but mostly in that part of, of Cuba, uh, those from the Canary Islands. Any other questions? I just want to mention one thing that this is uh, this was very important to me because you are uh, uh, as a student you are you probably have a lot of papers to do doing research and so on so it's, it's important to look at different sources for this it was very difficult because I cannot find uh, one one place to look at there was not the National Archive of Cuba I had I have to look at different different sources, different places, different local archives, sometimes very difficult, you sometimes don't, they were not, the documents were not in the best condition, but also oral history. So for you as a student, look at sources that you have available. And oral history is very, very, very good, right? You look uh, at that with the critical analysis and, and with knowledge. So oral history was very attractive to me and was an important part also of this, this work. Can you talk a little bit about that? How did you use oral history to reconstruct the history of the Well, because the last part, the last <coughs> part, I came to this to this topic first because I have a wonderful professor at Columbia University. Her name uh, is Professor uh, Silvia Rivera Cusicanqui. She is from Bolivia. And she told me about the importance of the subaltern, so called subaltern studies, right? And the importance of those who have no voice. <laughs> the vision of the other that were no part of the official history, the big history. So that was fascinating for me. And also because I have to convince my advisor of this, of this topic, and I say, okay, I know this town, I, 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 because part of my family uh, is from that town, so I say, okay, I know this town, and I remember seeing as I was a, a child that they were talking and talking and talking about tobacco and tobacco, and I say, okay, that's part of the nostalgia, right? But also, let's look at that, because there are material evidence that something was happening here regarding tobacco. And those mansions were for real. So, and those people talking were for real. So what happened was that I have, this, there are colonial census, uh, Republican census, uh, materials in general regarding transactions. You will see that the Spanish uh, administration in the New World was very good keeping records of everything, right? They were keeping records of everything. So for the colonial period was fine, but what's happened in the 20th century? I have to look at uh, uh, data from the tobacco uh, industry. I have to look data from migrations, and they were not clear, and that's a, a, an important topic. But I moved to the to the town. I tried to reach. Okay, there is any paper here? So I I have I found this local newspaper, and the local newspaper was the, a point of departure to try to look at people, right? Who were those people? And for me, there was. Uh, well, I, I think I was lucky that I could find a couple of survivors. And uh, they show me uh, uh, those uh, the ownership of brands, and also this is a <coughs> difficult topic to to reach because we could not have access to those uh, property papers before 1959. So most of them were uh, at the ha at the private houses, right? At private houses because I don't have access to that uh, mercantile uh, property records and so on. Uh, so because of nationalization. Of, all of this aspect that you know. So what's happening is I have these people. So I, 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 I conduct service. I have questionnaires for them. And, and I, I request uh, materials. Some of them gave it to me. Some of them were questioning. Some of them were not happy with what I, what I did. Some of them, of them were happy. Some of them said, OK, you probably talk more about uh, the Finca Madrasa because Madrasa was the big guy. For these people, that's the Patria Chica, right? That's the, that's, they have, yes, they know that you're part of Cuba, but they were more identified with their own land. So that's why uh, I found that very attractive. Okay? Any other questions? Thank you so much, guys. I uh, wish you the best.